chapter 1. But what have we learned so far? What have we learned so far from the apostle concerning Jesus Christ? You remember the premise that John writes this is to prove to his readers that Jesus Christ is, was, and always will be the Son of God. And so what we've learned before, uh, already from the, the first chapter is the fact that, uh, that Jesus was before creation. He always was, always is, and always will be. That Jesus was involved in the creation process. That He was with God and He was God. Now, how can you be with God and was God? Well, that's the mystery of the Trinity. Uh, Jesus was there and He was God. He's the source of life and he's the giver of light. And then he uses the witness of John the Baptist. When John saw Jesus come toward, coming toward him to be baptized, he announced literally to the world that here comes the one, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And then when he baptized Jesus, the Spirit in the form of a dove came down and remained on him. And then John the Baptist exclaims, I have seen and I testify that this is indeed the Son of God. And so listen, the Jesus that we worship this morning is not buried in some grave over there in Israel. I've got some friends that are over there in Israel right now, and they've already emailed me and told me that the tomb is empty. Okay, we don't worship a God who is still in the tomb. We worship a Jesus who is alive, and that's who we worship this morning. And so uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, uh, the Son of God, and this is Jesus Christ. And so the rest of chapter 1, we see where Jesus calls his first disciples. Uh, the first one was Andrew, and then, of course, Andrew got his brother Peter, and there was another disciple with Andrew, and I believe that disciple was none other than the Apostle John. And then later on, Peter calls a Philip. Philip goes back to call his friend Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, we found Jesus of Nazareth. And what was Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And so Jesus goes over to where Nathaniel is and introduces himself, and so they become believers. Now, Jesus' calling to his disciples this time is not to apostleship. It's just to belief on Him. Later on in chapter 12, we see where Jesus spends all night in a prayer session. He comes down and then He picks the 12 apostles. And so the calling right now is just uh, for belief in Him. And then last week, Gary began uh, chapter 2 with the wedding in Cana. We're not going to go into those details. And Bill, if that map is there, Bill, if you're there somewhere... Uh, just throw that map on the screen. Uh, Jesus uh, now leaves the Judean area. If you can see that in the southern area, uh, Jesus leaves that area. His mission has already been accomplished. His mission was twofold. Number one, in being with John the Baptist, he was announced as the Son of God. And number two, it was the place in which he called his first two disciples. And so he's finished now his uh, beginning ministry in Judea. And so he moves north into that that purple area uh, known as Galilee, and first, the first town that he stops in is the town of Gana, Cana, and you can see it just below the word Galilee there, and this is where he performs his first miracle. Uh, of course, I don't need to go into details. Uh, Gary talked about that last week where he turns the water into, uh, into wine, and so two things happen here in Cana, and verse 11 tells us this, this the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. And so two things happened here in Cana. Number one, his glory was revealed. You see, this was the first miracle. Uh, they've been traveling with Jesus now for a couple of days. It would have taken a couple of days to go uh, where they were with John the Baptist up there to Cana, uh, but they hadn't seen His glory revealed as of yet, and so now they have now through this miracle uh, at the, the wedding feast, and His disciples, His followers, uh, Andrew and Peter and John and Philip and Nathaniel at this point now believed on His name. And so all of that now is review, and so I want to begin this morning with uh, chapter 2 and verse 12. 
chapter 2, verse 12. And so after this, Jesus went down to a town of Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Now, if you look at the map, uh, there is this light blue area called the Sea of Galilee. Well, right to the north there is the town called Capernaum. Cana is of higher elevation. And so Jesus and his mother and brothers go down to sea level uh, to where Capernaum is, and it seems like this town of Capernaum is, uh, becomes the headquarters of Jesus Christ as he does this ministry here in the Galilean area. And coming with Jesus now from Cana are his followers, his disciples, uh, his mother and his brothers. Now, we don't hear them mentioned too much in the Scriptures. Uh, We know Jesus had an earthly mother named Mary, but nowhere do we see Joseph mentioned. Uh, In fact, at the first miracle there in Cana, we would expect that along with his mother and brothers, Joseph would be there. At Golgotha, after Jesus was crucified, normally, according to custom, it would be the father of the one who was crucified to take the body off of the cross and place it in the tomb. But again, Joseph, the father, his earthly father, was not there. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea was placed then with that responsibility. Also, when Jesus looked down from the cross and he saw Mary with the apostle John, uh, he said, John, you're mother and mother now your son. In other words, he gave charge of his mother to the apostle John. Normally that would have been placed in the care of his father, Joseph. And so somewhere along the line, uh, his father, his earthly father, from the time that Jesus was 12 years old when we last hear about Joseph, until this period when Jesus is 30 years old, Joseph probably passed away. And so what's left now of his family are his mother and his brothers, and they're mentioned. In fact, the book of Matthew chapter 13 gives us the names of Jesus' earthly brothers or his half-brothers. They are James, Uh, Joseph, uh, Judas, and Simon. Uh, James, most scholars believe, is the author of the book of James that we have in the New Testament. And the book of Jude that we have right before Revelation, many scholars believe that it was Jesus' half-brother Judas that wrote that particular book as well. But he also had several sisters, at least two of them. And according to custom, according to tradition, uh, their names were Rachel and Leah. Does that sound familiar? Uh, wives of Jacob back there in uh, the book of uh, Genesis. And so Jesus and his mother and his brothers and his disciples now move down to that lakeside town of Capernaum uh, where Jesus' ministry headquarters would be. And while he was there for a few days, uh, verse 13 says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus then went up to Jerusalem. So what does that mean? Jerusalem was on a hill, so they went up to Jerusalem. And so if you see Jerusalem, Jerusalem is way south uh, where that little white circle is. And so it was about a five or six day journey uh, for Jesus to make his way there then to, uh, to Jerusalem. This would be the first of perhaps maybe three or four journeys that Jesus would personally make from out of town into the city of Jerusalem. The first one being here, the second one being John chapters, or uh, Luke chapter 6, the third one being John chapter 6, and then the last one, of course, was his triumphal entry uh, right before his uh, crucifixion. And so Jesus leaves uh, Capernaum probably about a week prior to Passover. Now, understand this, that according to Exodus chapter 23, that every Jewish male was to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem during three of the seven feasts that the Israelites celebrated. There were seven of them. First of all, there was the Feast of Passover. And then there was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then there was the Feast of first fruits, And then there was the Feast of... Uh, not yet. There was the Feast of Pentecost, which, was, which is, um, that's not Rosh Hashanah, is it? Feast of Pentecost. And then there was the Feast of Trumpets. That's Rosh Hashanah. That's today, by the way. This is the Feast of Trumpets Day that the Jews celebrate. Then there was the Day of Atonement, and then there was the Feast of Tabernacles. Three of those feasts, Passover, Pentecost, 
and the Feast of Tabernacles were the three feasts where every Jewish male was required to be in Jerusalem. And so Jesus now being a good Jewish man, since it's a week prior to Passover, makes his way down to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. You remember Passover. It was the remembrance of God's deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. They had been in bondage for over 400 years. And so uh, Jesus makes his way uh, down to Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting. Uh, During this particular time, as people would move into town, they would ascend up into Jerusalem. Jerusalem because it was on a hill. And if you read the book of uh, Psalms, if you're familiar with the Psalms, Psalms 120 through Psalms 124 are called the Psalms of Ascents or Songs of Ascents, uh, which means they would ascend into Jerusalem. And so as the crowds would be making their way up into Jerusalem, they would sing these songs of David as they were awaiting the, fa- uh, the Passover celebration. Uh, one of those songs. In fact, I'll read one of them to you, Uh, Psalm 121. You don't have to turn there if if you don't want, if you trust me. This is one of the songs. Now, I'm not going to sing it, all right, because I don't know what the tune was. It said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And so you remember now they're singing this as they're ascending the hill into Jerusalem toward the temple in which they're going to be celebrating the Passover. Um, uh, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor by the moon, nor the moon by night. And so they would be singing this as they made their way towards Jerusalem. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and for evermore. And so the crowds by the thousands would be coming into Jerusalem, and as they would ascend towards Jerusalem to the temple, they would be singing these songs. So if you can imagine what it sounded like uh, as they would be making their way toward uh, the Passover celebration. Psalm 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with what? Praise, be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures through all generations. And so they would be singing. I wish I knew what the tunes were. David, we need to set some of these to music and, uh, and just sing these as we ascend up the steps into Stanton Baptist Church on Sunday morning. And so there was this heart of expectation from people as they approached Jerusalem during these times of feasting. And I would hope and I would pray that each one of us would have that hope of expectation as well when we come to church on Sunday morning. I came, I came early this morning, it was about five after six, and I looked up in the sky, and the sky was unbelievably clear, and you could see every star in the universe, well, not all the stars, but at least the ones that I could see, and as I was walking into the building, you know, I was just praying, I said, you know, Lord, give us a good morning in you. And that was just, it was this heart of, and it still is, there's heart of expectation that God is going to do something great, not only here, but within my heart as well. And so here's Jesus now coming up uh, with the crowds, singing these songs of ascents as they approach the temple. And so as Jesus comes and he sees the temple in front of him, verse 14 says, in the temple he found those who were worshiping. Hmm. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers were sitting there. Now, Gary explained this last week so eloquently. Uh, As you approach the temple, there were uh, three or four courts uh, in which certain people would be allowed. The outside court was called the court of the Gentiles as you approach the temple, and no Gentile was allowed past the wall. In fact, if you were a Gentile and you crossed over that high wall toward the temple, uh, you would be sentenced to death. 
fact, we know that to be. They have found signs. In fact, if you go to the museum there in Jerusalem, they have one of those signs that was posted on this high wall separating the Gentile court from the rest of the courts. And so if you were a Gentile, that's as far as you could go. The next court was the court of the Jewish women. And so this is where the Jewish woman then would be allowed to worship. The court after that celebrated, uh, separated by the wall would be the court of the Jewish men. And so they were allowed to worship there. They could come through the Gentile court. They could come through the women court and then to the court of the Jewish men. And then after that court was the court of the priests. And it was the court of the priests that you had the altar uh, and the table of showbread and the candlestick. All of that was there. And then you had the temple itself which supposedly back then during the time of Christ carried the very presence of God. I doubt that it was there at this particular point. But the veil was there. Whether the Ark of the Covenant was behind that veil, we don't know. After 586 B.C., we don't know nothing about the Ark uh, of, of the Covenant. Uh, but it was this approach then that Jesus makes His way, His house, as he makes his way toward the temple. And the first thing that he encounters in this outside Gentile court are all of these vendors that are selling animals and uh, people having tables set up in which they would exchange money. And Jesus looks at the scene and, and thinks to himself and then begins to think out loud, this temple now has become desecrated. This place of worship has become a uh, place of commercialism. Uh, Understand this, that when people would come from out of town, many of them would bring their animals with them. After all, it was the Passover. And on the Passover, you would sacrifice a what? You would sacrifice a lamb. And so many of them would bring the pick of the litter with them, but others, I'm sure many of them were not able to bring because perhaps maybe they came from north Galilee. And so they would come to the temple and so they could purchase a lamb there. Or they could purchase an oxen or they could purchase uh, a pigeon. If you were very, very, very poor and you couldn't afford uh, some of the larger animals, well, you could buy a pigeon, and that would be the sacrifice that you would present. And so many times when they would come to the temple, to this outer court, uh, the people, the vendors would look at the lamb that you had brought and said, no, 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 that's not good enough. You have to buy one of ours. And so they would hike the prices, and so people would have to fork over money to buy a sacrifice so that they could worship the Lord. And the money changers were also there as well. And so uh, there was the foreign exchange point where if you came from way out of town and the only thing that you had was foreign money, well, you can exchange your money at one of the money changers. And of course, they had their own uh, way of exchanging, uh, charging exorbitant interest. And so Jesus comes in to this and he sees the commotion that's going on into his house of, of prayer. And so somewhere along of the line, uh, worship in the temple had become big business. No longer was it a house of prayer. No longer was it a house of worship. The high priests owned all of these booths that were in the Gentile court. Many of the vendors were family members. And what was to be a place for Gentiles to come and worship? Uh, Jehovah God had become a place of, of commerce. And couple that with the fact that Jerusalem, a population of 100,000 people, would swell seven or eight times that during the Feast of Passover. And so the commotion that was there as Jesus enters his house and hears the noise of the money changers and the, 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 the animal noises and the smells and all that goes with it along with the crowds and the haggling of prices as they made their exchanges at these booths. How do you think Jesus felt about that? Because that's the first court that he hit as he went into his house. I mean, what would your reaction be? What would your reaction be? I I guess the only thing I can equate it to it, like if you were gone for three or four weeks and you came home to your house and found out that your house was broken into, anybody that ever happened to? Uh, Your house was broken into and all of your stuff is strewn around and all of the valuables are gone and you feel violated and you're thinking, I can't believe someone did this to my house. Well, that's the closest I can come to thinking how Jesus felt as he approached this awesome time of worship of Passover and to see that his house had become anything but 
a place of worship. And so look at what he does. Does he turn around and walk away? Eh, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm just going to leave. I'm quitting. No, look at what he does in verse 15. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple uh, with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their table. You talk about righteous anger. When we think about Jesus, we don't think about him doing this. Now, I don't think he beat the people. I, I really don't. All you had to do was beat the animals, and when the animals started running, the people would follow, right, because that's money in their pockets. And so Jesus makes this cord out of, out of, out of probably reeds, and he begins uh, beating uh, the animals, and so the animals begin uh, scattering, and he drove out the animals, and the men who were selling them followed, and he took the, the, the containers that had the coins that were unjustly gained, and he threw them over and overturned the table. If you can imagine the commotion that was going on, despite all of the crowds and the haggling that was going on, all of a sudden Jesus appears and he's taking the whip and, and the noise of the animals and the people and, and the yelling and the screaming. Uh, have you ever seen the videos or maybe you've been in there when uh, Walmart offers like one of those 70 inch TVs for like for 50 bucks? And they say only 50 of them were available. And so the 50, first 50 who show up get to claim them. And people are crowded by the door. I mean, their faces are pressed up against the glass. And, and when the doors are open, man, people start running in. And clothes are flying and fists are, are flying as people try to claim uh, their gift. That's the only thing that I can compare to what's going on here. Mass pandemonium is going on. And I think the amazing thing is this. Why did not anybody challenge him? Come on, Jesus. Come on, put him up right now. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Why did nobody challenge him? I mean, he was a stranger, right? Nobody knew who he was. At least we don't think they knew who he was. Um, uh, maybe their consciences were bothering them that they knew what they were doing was wrong here in this, this sacred temple. Uh, maybe they had heard the testimony of John the Baptist that this was the Messiah, that this was the Son of God. I don't know why. Would you challenge him? I don't. Would you fight God? Yeah, no, I wouldn't. Come on, Jesus. No, nah, I don't think so. All he'd have to do is say a word, right? I'd be flat on the ground. Uh, and he was rough. I believe Jesus was rough hewn. He was a carpenter, right? His hands were rough. He was probably tall. I wouldn't mess with Jesus. They didn't. And so this is what happened. And, so, and I thought to myself, you know, it's okay to get angry at sin. You just have to watch what you do. And Gary mentioned this last week. The Bible says, be angry, but don't sin. There's a way to get angry, but don't go overboard with it. You know, when we, when we spank our children, you know, it's, it's not out of anger. Well, it may be, you know, be, it may be angry at what they did, but you spank it. You don't do it because you hate them, but you do, that, you do that because you know what is right. I call that righteous anger. I don't think the kids, no, I never had to spank Jessie. She was perfect. Nady too. Nady, Nady was perfect too. I didn't have to spank them at all. I'm sure they wanted to spank me a couple of times, but um, that's righteous anger. And so this is what happens here. You know what? The bottom line is they had forgotten what worship was about. I mean, originally God, God appeared to Moses. He said, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. You see, a sanctuary was a place for a relationship to be established. The sanctuary was a place to, for fellowship to be maintained. And the sanctuary was a place uh, to reconnect with God. And so as Jesus approaches his house and he sees all that is going on, and in righteous anger, he just takes out the whips and drives all of that out. Why? Because he realized that this was not the purpose of this place. And so he tells them, uh, but it's, it's interesting what he says here, verse 16, and he told those who sold the pigeons, the guys with the pigeons are the only ones left, right? Everyone else is gone, but the guys with the pigeons are still there. Why? Driving them out wouldn't work. Why? Because the pigeons would have been in cages, right? And so they're just left standing there while everybody else is gone in the midst of all the commotion. And he said, and you guys with the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a place of trade. Don't make it a house of trade. And do you think they picked up their pigeons and walked? The pigeon pickers? <laughs> yeah, they did. They picked up those cages and they vamoosed out of there very, very, very quickly. Why? Because they had made it a house of trade. I think they knew. 
I think they knew that what they were doing uh, was wrong. Uh, it's interesting that God had told the Israelite nation years ago in the book of Isaiah, he said, I will make you a light for the nations, not just the Jewish people, not just for Israel. He said, I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And they had become anything but. They had made what God had given them very exclusive just to them. And so it was enclosed in that temple, and it was separated by different cords. And don't you dare cross that cord. Can you imagine if church was like that? Uh, the last two rows are for the visitors. Uh, the next two rows are for the women. <laughs> the next couple of rows are for the men. The front rows are for the elders and for the deacon. Can you imagine if church was like that? That's what they had made it into. And it was not to be that way at all. He said, listen, I have made you a light for the Gentiles. Um, in this case, I don't think that light had even got, I don't think the light was there at all and had not been there until Jesus walked onto uh, the scene. And I believe that's what's happened to many of our churches today. Uh, we have allowed the light to stay within the four walls of the church. We've become very comfortable with what we have. Uh, we, we become complacent. And you know what, let's just keep what we have between these four walls because you know what, there's a lot of stuff going on out there and we don't want that in here. That's not the purpose of the church at all, is it? The purpose of the church is to bring people in, to bring people in. And so Jesus sees the purpose for which he had even directed the temple to be built being abused in an unbelievable way. This was not God's intent for his temple at all. That's not God's intent for church at all. It's not to be that. The windows should be wide open. We should have a speaker in each window in here and blaring out to the community about what we're worshiping and what we're praising about and what we're preaching about here. And that's the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. He is what is important. And then lastly, verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will come consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. They remembered. I believe that his disciples, I believe some of them were students of the word. In fact, when God called Philip and Nathaniel, they knew that this was the Messiah. He didn't have to say much to them. He knew that it was the Messiah. So, but the point I wanted to make this morning is this. What is the purpose of church? What is the purpose of the house of God? What's your purpose for coming here this morning? What is your purpose? Did you come expecting something? Did you come expecting something? You certainly didn't come for the way I dress, right? It's not like I'm styling it or anything. Why did you come? Fellowship is important. All of that is important. The food is great. It's always great. Those, don those donuts this morning, David, I had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Because I had to change the way I eat. And so there was about seven or eight extra donuts that are on, still on the tray right there because I didn't eat what I normally eat on, on Sunday morning. But what is the purpose of church? And I think the book of Acts gives us that. And we studied this, I think, maybe two or three years ago. Acts chapter 2 said this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the word, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's what the purpose of church is. Well, what do you mean the apostles' teaching? The purpose of church is to learn from the Word of God. That's why I preach. For, I can't do topical preaching. I'm not smart enough to do that. I've got to go verse by verse, and then I take it from there. But the Bible speaks for itself. We, we need to become students of the Word. That's why we have 930 classes. A 930 class, Gary uh, teaches an awesome class for the men downstairs. Tim teaches an awesome class uh, right here in, in the library. And I teach class down there right beside the fellowship hall. Those are all geared to you uh, so that you can learn the Word of God. Well, you have a great time in our class, man. We discussed a lot today. I know Tim's class. In fact, Tim came into my class th last week, and, and they had discussion learning the Word. And I know Gary's class, uh, they get through a verse, and all of a sudden, man, they're talking about the Lord and, and learning all of these things. And my wife with the children, she's got a bunch of kids there uh, this morning. She's great with kids. And so the Word, the Word, we need to learn the Word of God. I had, I think I told you this a couple of weeks. I had someone told me, not at this church, um, they said, well, I'm not coming to Bible study because I already know all of that. 
I'm thinking, yes, I do. Then you need to be teaching then. Come on. <laughs> no way. we. I don't know. Every time I teach, I learn something. And that's the way it should be at the 930. That's what we do on Wednesday nights. We have a great dinner at 5 o'clock, and then at 6 o'clock, we're going through the book of Joshua. I, got, I think we got through one verse Wednesday night, was it? One verse I think we got through. But that's okay. We're discussing and we're learning together. That's what we need to do. And so they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, and they devoted themselves to the fellowship. We have a lot of fellowship. Come early on Sunday morning, man. We had, Around the coffee, well, I didn't have any. And around the donuts, I didn't have any either. But it's the time of fellowship as we, as we, as we do that together. When church is done, my wife has fixed a, a meal. Uh, after choir practice, the choir will be eating. You can eat right away as soon as uh, church is done. Just that time of fellowship. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. And when we're together uh, in fellowship like that, man, I don't know about you, but I feel stronger. I feel stronger when, when I do that. And then it says, uh, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that means that front and center is the Lord Jesus Christ. Front and center is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He must be the central focal point of all that we do here. Without Jesus, we have a dead religion, right? Without Jesus, we have a Bible that is loosely fit. Nothing makes sense. But when you take the name of Jesus and you look from Genesis right through Revelation, you have something that is clear cut from Genesis right on through Revelation. And so we devote themselves, ourselves, to the breaking of bread and, and frequently we'll do just that. Where we, um, the crackers and the grape juice, uh, the remembrance of his broken body on the cross and his shed blood on the cross for you and for me. And then lastly, um, well, that, and to prayer. And they devoted themselves to prayer. And I can't say enough about this. And I got to tell you this there is a movement going on. Uh, I know in Bedford County and I know in Campbell County where pastors are getting together, and the theme, the main theme is prayer. And we've been going through um, Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire as, as a leadership team. I just got a book now from uh, Jim Cimbala called Fan the Flame. I don't even think it's out yet. I think maybe it's just out. And it all deals with prayer. And I believe the church will only be as strong as its prayer group. I truly believe that. And the more I'm in ministry, and I'm almost 70 years old, I believe the more that we're in ministry, that prayer is the key. In fact, Falwell Sr. said this, nothing of eternal value can be accomplished apart from prayer. Uh, there are churches that are moving uh, to a once a week, just strictly prayer meeting in this county. And we do ours once a month, and that may change, I don't know. And if it does, it'll be more frequent. So I want to encourage you, uh, this church will be only as strong as those who are praying. Not only as individuals, but we come corporately together as well. That's a hard meeting to come to. It really is. We're just coming to pray? Well, yeah. Just think about it. I was thinking about this this morning as I was driving in, and I got up and I got into my car and I looked up and I saw all of the stars. And, and, and it's interesting, you can see the small stars if you look away from them. But if you look directly at them, they seem to disappear. And so if you look away, you can see actually more stars. And I was thinking as I was coming in and I was praying about the service, I thought, you know what? I have the opportunity, I have the privilege, I have the honor of speaking to the one who created all of that. Think about that. And we have that privilege 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, except for leap year when we have 366. Those four things are what makes a church. I promise you, I will always preach the word. I will always do that. And we will always fellowship. We will always eat. You can't be a Baptist and not eat. And so we will always eat. <laughs> And then we will always break bread together. We will always make front and center the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are making prayer a priority. Oh, that's just not an exciting service. Well, yeah, it is. When you lay a hold of God, I guarantee it will be an exciting for you. That's my prayer for this church. That's where we need to be headed. Amen.
Let's sing this last hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. one thing before we leave. A couple of weeks ago, um, uh, JF Junior Varsity football team came to Stanton River to play a game. And what was the score, Peyton? Luke? We beat them, though, right? Uh, well, let me say that Jefferson Forest beat Stanton River, and their quarterback, Peyton, raise your hand, my grandson, and Luke, they're an offensive end and defensive, raise your hand, Luke. They were there in the midst of that fight, and I, uh, I had to make mention of that since they were here. To, not to rub it in or anything. <laughs> not to rub it in. But it was at a great game, and both sides did awesome. And, of course, my two grandsons, they did the best. And we were there cheering them on. And under my breath, when, J, uh, when Stanton River scored, I, yeah, you know, just kind of under my because I was on the JF side, so I had to be very careful, you know. And so I, but I thought I'd mention that spiritual anecdote before we left. But anyway... <laughs> It, it was. Randy Randy was a coach, coached these guys for a number of years. Randy, raise your hand, my son-in-law. And, uh, and it was. The sportsmanship was unbelievable on both sides. That's a testament to the coaches, and that's a testament to the caliber of, of, caliber of kids. That are, you can be proud of Stanton River. Uh, I'm certainly proud of, and I'm proud of them, and I'm also proud of uh, JF and the coaches and, and the players. Uh, how awesome. God was represented out there on, the, on those fields, and I think everybody saw it as well. Anyway, that's it. Let's go eat, right? <laughs> Did I pray? Yeah. Oh, no, no, let me pray <laughs> before we eat. Father, we thank you. Uh, Father, you're a good God. Uh, and Father, we, we hail the power of Jesus' name, uh, not because he's dead, Father, but because he's alive. We worship a living God. Lord, I pray that we would become a church that you designed, Lord, a church that gets into your word, Lord, a church that prays, a church that fellowships together, Lord, and a church that, remember that, that remembers that Jesus Christ is front and center. Lord, may it always be that way. Thank you, Lord, for your love to us. Thank you for your goodness. Be with us this now, this day, Lord, in your precious name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen.